this presentation is really going to be a brief history of the New Zealand tax system and how uh, we've gotten to the situation we've gotten in today and, and why the Opportunities Party has its tax proposal as a, as a result of that. There's going to be a, a blog online with uh, all, all of the detail and uh, sources from tonight's presentation. Most of the work uh, comes from either the tax working group itself, our own workings, or uh, a lot of work by a chap called Andrew Coleman, who I encourage you to, to, to read if you like. But all those sources will be in the blog, which will be up after this presentation, uh, along with the video. And what I want to make clear right at the start, yes, we are talking about changing the way we tax in this country, but we are not talking about taxing any more. We're not talking about taking any more money. Okay, so we are talking about ensuring that we tax the income from assets properly, uh, but that money would all go to reducing income taxes. And, uh, you know, depending on all of the details about about how that tax looks, which we'll talk about tonight, if you, if you took the most extreme version of what we're promoting, you could afford to, to cut income taxes by 30%. Okay? So, roughly speaking, for most people, that's... <laughs> For, for most people, that's 8% uh, of your salary extra you'd get in your pocket on average because about most people lose about a quarter of their salary as it is in, in income taxes. So about an 8% bonus uh, on what you get now. So to start with where we are now, this is, where, uh, uh, this is what our tax system currently looks like. And to be honest, it slightly surprises a lot of people to see that actually the tax on owner-occupied housing is the lowest compared to any other asset that we have in our country. So you can see bank accounts, businesses, all taxed quite heavily. Of course, some multinationals managed to slip through that net, but that is a, that is a whole other question. But the two that get taxed the least are rental property and even less than that is owner occupied housing. So this is usually takes people by surprise and so I'll, I'm going to spend a bit of time drilling down into into how we got here. So in the 1980s our tax system changed from an incredibly complex system which had, which had lots of exemptions to a very simple tax system. And the idea behind this simple tax system was that most assets get taxed twice. Most investments get taxed twice. So the first time they get taxed is when you earn the income that you use to purchase the investment, either to invest in the business, put the money in the bank, buy the house, whatever. So the, the income that you earn gets taxed and then you buy that investment. Now that might seem totally normal to you, but that isn't the case in every country in the world. In a lot of countries in the world, you don't pay tax when you put money into a retirement savings account, for example. So that, that tax gets uh, written off, uh, effectively given back to you. Okay? So you can put more money, tax pre-tax money, into that retirement savings account. So this was quite a big change in our tax system that happened in the 1980s. And then the investment gets taxed again when it generates income. So your bank deposit earns interest, the company you own earns profit or the shares you own uh, give you dividends and when that money comes to you, you pay tax on that again. So it's effectively a, a system of double taxation. Now the one that we don't tax again is property. And that's because when you own property Effectively, you're your own landlord, if it's an owner-occupied property. If it's an owner-occupied property, you are your own landlord, you're paying rent to yourself. It's something that economists call imputed rental. And because you're paying rent to yourself, no cash changes hands, so no tax needs to be paid. So therefore, that's why owner-occupied housing is the least taxed because the returns you get from living in your own home are not taxed. So compared to the return on other assets, 
there's a really big difference in New Zealand. That difference is bigger than any other country in the world. Right? What are the impacts of that? On Hang on, we're going to come to that, Patty. We're doing questions later. Thanks. Okay. So, so the, the rental property uh, is, is treated slightly differently because, of course, if you own a rental property, someone pays you rent and you do pay tax on that rental. However, because of the demand for owner-occupied property, because, of, because everyone's after the tax loophole on owner-occupied housing, we have this massive capital gain. Now, theoretically in our tax system, capital gains shouldn't need to be taxed. Because all of the returns on these assets are currently taxed. But when it comes to property, because we are not taxing the returns on owner-occupied housing, it does make sense to tax capital gain. At, you know, in a lot of countries in the world. But that's only if you do it every year, and it's only if you do it on the basis of all housing, not giving exemptions as the current proposal is. Now, the trouble with a capital gains tax, which we'll discuss later, is that, well, the current proposal, there's the exemption on owner-occupied housing, and the second problem is that we wait until the asset is sold before that tax is, is levied. So there's a big incentive not to sell or to delay selling, and that's bad for the economy. Businesses get held on to too long, houses get held on to too long, you have elderly people rattling around in a massive house in the middle of town, like my parents do. And when that could really be passed on, it would be more productive to, to pass those houses on to younger couples that need them. So, that's the pro problem with a capital gains tax. A capital gains tax was actually considered in the 1980s as part of this reform. But, as we all know, the Labour government shit itself, fell apart, had its cup of tea, and the whole concept disappeared. Of course, the national government coming in in the 1990s had no interest, had no, in, no intention of, of putting in a capital gains tax. So it was considered, and that would have been the time to have a capital gains tax. 30 years ago, before we got all the capital gain that we've seen in the last 30 years. So the result is that we have the biggest differential in the world between the way our housing is taxed, our property is taxed, and other investments. So we'll come on to the, we'll come on to the impacts of that in just a moment, but just to compare that with what happens internationally, well, some ca countries tax the imputed rental, which is what the Opportunities Party is proposing, and is, you know, uh, that would then lift the amount of tax on the owner-occupied housing up to the level of other investments. And they wouldn't need a capital gains tax because we wouldn't have capital gain. People wouldn't be speculating on this asset if they had to pay the, the, the true returns each and every year, which is what we're proposing. So Iceland, Switzerland, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Slovenia, to some degree South Korea, these countries all tax imputed rental. So this is not unusual in the world. Other countries don't tax imputed rental, but what they do, and this is the big conversation you don't hear when people talk about Scandinavia or Germany, yes they have high personal marginal tax rates on their personal income, but the tax rates on investments are very low in these countries. If you put money into a retirement savings account, you don't get taxed. If you put money into term deposits, often you don't get taxed. So the incentive to invest in housing as opposed to other investments in these countries doesn't exist. That's why you don't see the speculation. That's why you see people investing in productive businesses that can actually create jobs and exports rather than speculating on housing 
as we see in New Zealand and other Anglo countries, including Anglo countries that have a capital gains tax excluding the family home, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But the Anglos, the Anglo countries are really the standout on this and they are the countries that have had this crazy housing bubble in recent years. And that's what we see here in New Zealand. Since this tax change took place, house prices and to a lesser degree rents have been rising faster than both prices and incomes. So housing affordability has been deteriorating from a ratio of roughly three to one, so three times the average household income, which is what internationally is considered affordable. That's where New Zealand was in the 1980s, to in some places now, nine or 10 to one in our country. Some of the most unaffordable housing markets in the Western world. As landlords struggle to try and keep some sort of real return on their assets, they have followed suit and hiked up rents. So now people are working three or four hours, average people are working three or four hours more per week, every week, just to pay the rent. Because for the past 30 years, rents have been rising faster than incomes. So that's been the real impact on people. A lot of people talk, a lot of people talk about, is it the reserve, uh, you know, the uh, Resource Management Act, or is it the, uh, you know, uh, the cheap credit that's been around in recent years? There's other explanations, and yes, those are all contributors. Immigration, yes, it's a contributor. But it's very hard to deny that the tax system is having an impact on this. And, th and this reason is another major reason why we don't actually have a housing problem. There's enough bedrooms in New Zealand, more than enough bedrooms in New Zealand, for everyone to still have a spare bedroom and to house everyone, to get rid of overcrowding, to get rid of homelessness. We could do that. Why? It's because we've been building bigger and bigger homes and having more and more spare bedrooms. New Zealand, since the 1980s, has had the biggest increase in home size of any Western country in the world. So you can't tell me we have a supply problem or that the Resource Management Act is getting in the way. The only possible explanation of this is our tax loophole. So as I said, the amount of work people are doing to pay for their rent has been rising by between you know, three and four hours since the early 90s. And this has really hit people at the bottom end. So people at the bottom end are where we have seen house, the cost of housing rising far faster than the, their incomes. Housing is chewing up more and more of their incomes. The bottom 10% of our country actually is no better off now than they were in the 1980s in real terms. That is because of the cost of housing. So some real pressures at the bottom end. So that's driving what, why we're seeing the poor getting poorer and more and more people at the food banks. At the top end, housing is what's driving why the rich are getting richer too. Almost entirely the increase and the wealth of the top 20% of New Zealanders in the past decade, two decades, has been housing. In fact, in the two, past two decades, the only reason how inequality has been rising is because of housing. Because the rich are getting richer and the poor are facing higher costs. So you see that difference between the before housing costs and the after housing costs. Before Housing costs, income inequality is not rising at all. Hasn't risen in 20 years. So all the stuff you hear about, <coughs> employers are to blame, workers aren't getting their fair share, it's, it's crap. For the past 20 years, our businesses have actually been giving em employees their fair share. The stuff you hear from the US doesn't apply here. Yes, inequality rose in the 1980s and early 1990s with the Employment Contracts Act. But that since then, since the mid-1990s, 
That hasn't been the case. It's all been housing, 100%. As I said, housing is why inequality is growing. But that really interesting line there is that bottom 10%. So the, low, the bottom 10% of households no better off in real terms after housing costs than they were in 1982. But the real joke with this thing is that we all feel richer, but our economy is actually not performing any better as a, as a result of it. We have appalling productivity because we've been sticking all our money into housing. And our economy is actually facing really high risk because of our foreign debt. Because how do we pay for all this bidding up of housing? We're not earning any more money to pay for it, so we just borrow it. And again, that is another big reason why our economy is so much at risk from this issue. To those who claim that cheap credit is due to the, to the rise in house prices in the, last, in the last few years, well, we've had, had cheap credit for about the last seven or eight years, right? New Zealand's had the fastest growth in house prices over that period. So you can't tell me it's just cheap credit. There's something else going on here. And when you compare us to other countries, it's actually quite scary. So some of the other Anglo countries like Ireland had a big housing boom, they had a crash, their, their housing markets are recovering now. Ours are now far out of whack with any other housing market in the world. And you can't tell me that it's impossible to keep house prices stable because other countries have done it. That's up there, that's uh, Germany and Switzerland. And when you look at things taking into account what we can afford, the house price to income ratio, it looks even worse. Housing affordability has been improving in a lot of European countries over the last 30 years. Improving. And here's the kicker. So the recent Demography uh, uh, International report rated New Zealand the worst of the developed countries in terms of housing affordability, around about seven times our household income. The two countries just behind us, slightly less unaffordable, but still completely unaffordable housing markets, were Australia and the UK. Both have a cap capital gains tax excluding the family home. Is that really what we're aiming for here? To be slightly less worse than we are now? Finally, so a lot of people talk about construction costs. Well, that actually is not the driver of higher house prices. It's land. Land is the key driver of higher house prices over the past 20 years. And what's driving that is land banking. And what's driving that? Our tax system. I've talked to land bankers who talk about investing in land. Not developing it, but just buying land on the city fringes, selling it, not paying tax, simply, simply because they know the value is going north. A capital gains tax would just tax that. We don't want to tax that, we want to kill that capital gain and actually give these people an incentive to develop the land. And that's what our, our plan effectively does. How do we fix it? There's two ways to fix our broken tax system. And neither of them are a capital gains tax excluding the family home. As I mentioned before, Europe, you know, Europe has basically two models. One is our model, which I'll come to in a moment. The other is to lower all of the other bars, all of the other taxes on other forms of investment income. That's what you see Scandinavia and, and Germany countries like that do. So that there's just as much incentive to invest in businesses, in retirement income, and in, you know, in savings accounts, all that sort of stuff, as to invest in property. 
So that's another way of doing it other than what we are proposing. But the question is, where does the money come from for that? This is the reason that Scandinavia has such high personal marginal income tax rates, up around 50% in a lot of cases. The reason they tax income that highly, everyone thinks it's for wonderful egalitarian reasons, but actually so, it's so that they can provide this other investments, the same tax loopholes that property gets. So that people are willing to invest in businesses that actually create jobs and exports. Scandinavians understand that. So that's one way to do it. Effectively reduce the taxes on all other forms of investment, on businesses, on retirement income saving schemes, all those sorts of things. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is what we're proposing. Lifting the tax rates on effectively property to make sure that they're paying at least as much tax as all other forms of investment. At least as much tax as a bank deposit, think of it that way. So how is this tax calculated? Well if you think, if you've got a million bucks in a house, if you had that million bucks in a bank account, it would be earning, what is it these days? 1%. 4%. 4%, in a lot of cases, you get about 4% interest on that. Say you're, say you're paying, a, an, say you're paying an, a, an average tax rate of 25%, that would be effectively a 1% tax on that million dollar bank account. Yeah, it might be three, we can, we can debate that, but that's the, that's the concept of what we're talking about here, right? That you make sure that property and all investments, in fact, are paying at least as much tax as you would do in a bank deposit. Now, if you do that, you actually generate an, a hell of a lot of income and you can afford to reduce income taxes substantially. The numbers that we did it on was based on if you had a 5% deemed rate of return, which admittedly, you know, the world has changed and it's come down since then. But if you had a, a deemed rate of return of 5%, and a marginal tax rate of 33%, that's about a 1.5% tax rate on, minimum tax rate uh, on all assets. That would earn you enough money to reduce income taxes by about a third. So that gives you an idea of the scale of this. And just one final comment before we move to questions on a capital gains tax excluding the family home. Have a look and see what it, that would do to the bars above. It would actually increase the tax rate on rental property, which is what's intended here, because when you sell a rental property, you would have to pay that capital gains tax. But it leaves the owner-occupied house untouched. And when you consider the capital gains tax will nudge up the tax rates on business taxation as well, it actually widens the gap between other forms of investment and investing in the family home. And this is why we see when we have a capital gains tax overseas, you get more and more investment in the family home. It's the so-called mansion effect that they see in Australia. What are, where do rich people stick their money? Buy a bigger house. Buy the house next door, knock through. Knock it down, put a tennis court on it. Doesn't matter. Stick it all in the family home. So it's going to encourage more investment into owner-occupied housing. A capital gains tax excluding the family home will not solve our key problem, which is that we invest in houses instead of businesses. And this is what we see time and time again, Anglo countries around the world, a capital gains tax minus the family home. Yes, it takes the edge off the housing bubble, but it doesn't stop it. It doesn't stop capital gain, it just taxes it. That would have been really great 30 years ago. It's not much use now. What we need to do is actually stop capital gain entirely and give people an incentive to invest in assets that actually create something. So that is my presentation. 
I want to finish with a little analogy. The housing market is not a ladder. It's an elevator. That elevator is currently on the 10th floor and it's still rising. A capital gains tax is going to slow the speed with which that continues to rise. So my question to younger generations, and I'll address this to you, is, no, no, to the camera. <laughs> my, my question to you is, are you going to put up with a capital gains tax and try sprinting up the stairs to catch the elevator before it rises much higher? Are you going to shackle yourselves to a lifetime of debt with overvalued house prices? Or are you going to press the elevator call button and bring that bloody elevator right back down again? Because that's where it should be. And the only way to, to bring that elevator back down, the, the label on that call button is voting for the Opportunities Party. So, okay, do we have questions? Should we, start, should we start with one of the questions from online? Yeah, all right, is the microphone working? Are we good? Okay, fantastic. Here's the first question from online, Jeff. What are the practicalities of an annual tax on housing? Admin challenges, opportunities to gain the system, etc. Yeah. So, um, so the first thing I'd say is that there's actually far fewer opportunities to gain the system uh, with an annual tax on housing what, as we're proposing because uh, it's happening every year. A capital gains tax tends to be levied when the asset is sold. So of course, lots of ways to game the system there. Number one, don't sell it. Just you know, push that, push that out even further. Um, in terms of practicalities, this tax is very simple and pure. Uh, there's no depreciation, there's no write-offs. You just have to pay the amount of tax that that asset would pay each and every year as if it was a bank deposit. So compared to a capital gains tax again where there's all sorts of write-offs and calculations to make, relatively simple. You'd see people, for most people, this, the, the only thing that would be affected is the house that they own. Uh, that would have a relatively stable valuation under this tax proposal because we wouldn't see nearly so much capital gain. Uh, particularly if it was phased in over time. And so your CV would, or GV would, would uh, form the basis of, of the tax assessment made every year. So fairly straightforward in that respect. Uh, in terms of other assets, for rich people that have other assets, uh, yes, gold bars technically would be included. Super yachts, yes, would be included. Um, you'd, you'd make assessments on that based on insurance valuations. Uh, as, a, as a starting point. So administratively, this would be administratively more difficult for the top 20% of society which owns most of the wealth, but for the average Kiwi, not a big deal. Yeah. Okay, do we have a question from the room? Jeff, how do you think we get the general public through the cause and effect moment? Because New Zealanders are great at voting out any government that tries to bring something in that doesn't have an immediate impact. So what's the kind of timing between putting something like this in place and the general public seeing an immediate gain in their life financially? Yeah. <clears throat> so implementation of this policy is, is essential. Uh, we don't want to... We don't want to crash the housing market because, as I said, you know, our economy is actually very vulnerable to all this foreign debt we've toted up. So we have to deflate this bubble slowly and carefully. So we're talking about phasing in this tax over 10 to 15 years. And if you do that, you keep house prices stable for 10 to 15 years and, uh, and you'll slowly uh, improve affordability because over that time incomes and prices rise. Uh, and so the houses become more affordable. People then have time to shift their asset portfolio, start to invest in things. Um, but of course, the downside of that is because you're phasing in the tax, 
takes a while to generate the income and therefore it takes a while for people to see the benefits in terms of income tax cuts. So that would take a while to, to, to fully realise. Um, but I think people would instantly see the benefits in terms of the end of capital gain and people starting to invest in businesses that actually created jobs and incomes. And, and that would be the big gainer for people because that would improve productivity, uh, improve, our, improve our incomes over, the, over that sort of 10 to 15 year period. Yeah. Another, on, you wanna go online, no? Oh, so, is, that a, is that a follow-up? Sure. Yeah, it's a follow-up. So, would there be an impact, do you think, on our economy and the, type, the mix of um, industries that are in it if we change this? Because at the moment, um, some of the, the biggest industries um, or the biggest earners in our economy are tourism and dairy, right? And it strikes me that, that they may not be um, the most sustainable over the long term, do you think we would see innovation in, in the digital economy as a result of changing the way people invest in business based on having um, a, a tax on wealth and housing? <clears throat> Absolutely. I mean, um, so because of, um, because of our tax system, like I said, we have less investment in businesses than most countries in the world. So. We invest, we, we invest more of our wealth in housing than any other developed country in the world, okay? Uh, and that again is simply due to the fact that the differential between the way we tax housing and other forms of investment is the greatest in the world. But even, I think we'd even see a qualitative difference in, in the stuff that we invest in too, because as a country, if you put aside housing, where's most of our investment gone? It's gone into land-based businesses, farming. And that has generally been to chase capital gain. There's no way that farming in the Mackenzie country makes any sense economically. It doesn't generate the profit to make it worthwhile. So why is it being done? Untaxed capital gain. Why does the supposed backbone of our economy, farming, on average, earn less in terms of the return on investment? Certainly sheep and beef returns have been around 2% for the last 20 years. How's that justifiable? Why are people continuing to invest in sheep and beef on the basis of that kind of return? The answer, untaxed capital gain. So I think not only would we see greater investment going into business, but I think we'd see a big change in the stuff that we do invest in from people chasing untaxed capital gain to actually trying to invest in businesses that actually create returns. Because this tax wouldn't affect businesses that create returns because it's a deemed rate of return. If your business is earning at least as much as a bank deposit, which most businesses worth their salt are, you don't pay any more tax. Yeah. All right, we'll just uh, take one more from the internet first, and then I'll get right there to you. The one from the internet is, why not just a land tax? Why not just a land tax? Good question. So, a land tax is fantastic in theory because it doesn't give you any disincentive to invest in, uh, in productive undertakings. The idea of a land tax is that you would get rid of all of these taxes. So there'd be no tax on businesses, there'd be no tax on, um, on property, there'd be no tax on bank deposits, all that sort of stuff. You'd just have a land tax instead. The big problem with a land tax is transition. Okay? So the, the ultimate goal of a land tax is that land values drop to zero and a land tax becomes basically like a lease that actually the owner is paying the government the same amount as you'd pay a lease because the land is, the, the, uh, the unimproved value of the land is zero uh, because of the land tax. Now you can't avoid it because land is always there. 
there's there's no uh, you know there's no disincentive to um, to invest because that, that's all about improvements. Any sort of improvements don't get taxed. This just tax, taxes the unimproved value of the land. So theoretically, a land value tax is a great idea. Unfortunately, our current tax system is based on taxing the returns from investments. It's a very different setup. So if you introduced a land value tax right now, it would completely hammer farmers because they're already paying tax on the profits that they earn and then they'd be paying a land tax on top of that. So land values would rapidly plummet, which of course wouldn't, wouldn't make farmers too happy and would, and would actually be quite de destabilising to our, to our economy in the short term. So how do you get there? A lot of people when they talk about a land value tax, they talk about providing exemptions for farmers if they, for, for landowners if they have high debt. Providing exemptions for landowners if, if that land is being used for productive tax paying purposes. Basically that looks like the tax that we're proposing. <laughs> okay, so when you, when you start providing exemptions on the land value tax to make it palatable, it starts to very rapidly look like the proposal that we're, that we're looking, putting forward. So to land value tax proponents, I say to you, this is a stepping stone to your nirvana. Personally, I'm sceptical about the, about the fact that you can ever raise enough money from a land value tax to get rid of all these other taxes, which is what you'd need to do to really make a land value tax truly effective. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, I've got a question. Yeah. Um, it seems to me that we're kind of talking about two things here. The one is a capital gains tax and the other is a wealth tax. And they're very different things. Because a um, capital gains tax is essentially a, ca a, a, a tax on realised um, on realised gains. It's, it's like yep. an income tax, really. It's just broadening yep. the income tax. Yeah. But really the issue surely is about wealth taxes because the, the issue which the Western world is facing if you, follow, if you follow Piketty, is an increase not in, it's a disparity, not so much in income as in wealth, and it's the accumulation of wealth, which is the, the, the exponential accumulation of wealth, which is the problem. Can you just yep. address this question about what, are you, what you're proposing, is it a wealth tax or is it a broadening of the income tax regime? It's, it's interesting to hear the, the government and the tax working group about talk, talking about a capital gains tax being a, a tax on the income from capital because they've, they've really stolen that wording from us. Um, pure wealth taxes as Piketty proposed and Piketty acknowledges haven't worked. So they've been implemented in France and people just shift their wealth overseas. So you could view this as a, as a form of wealth tax, but really what it's saying is this is a, a tax on the, on the income from wealth. It's making sure that all wealth pays tax, pays a minimum level of tax. All income, well, all, all wealth pays tax on the income that the, that the owners of that wealth receive, whether that income is cash or in other forms, right? But the idea is that if you have a super yacht, you use that super yacht, you get value from that super yacht, just as you get value from money in the bank, why don't you pay tax on that super yacht? So you can, in simplistic terms, view this as a, as a, as a wealth tax, um, but really it is a tax on the, the benefits from wealth, the, re, the, re, the returns from wealth. Yeah, it's, an, it's, a, it's a deemed rate of return. Yeah. Hang on, we'll get, you, we'll get you a microphone. So the deemed rates of returns or imputed rates of returns seem to be a bit of a bogeyman um, when, when, when you talk to them about people, but I understand that they are actually used in other areas. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, we, we have a deemed rate of return tax for foreign shares, for example. Um, and like I said, uh, these, these sorts of taxes do exist in, in uh, South Korea, 
uh, in the Netherlands, in uh, Belgium, in Switzerland. These other countries do have effectively what we are proposing. So it's not, it's not entirely uh, original or unseen around the world, for sure. Yeah. All right, here's another one from the internet. This will be an easy one for you, Jeff. How is the tax calculated? Mm. Okay, so we have a deemed rate of return that would be similar to what you'd get from a long-term bank deposit. So, uh, like I said, we originally calculated this tax on a 5% on a return, but realistically these days it's, it's more like 4%, maybe even 3 somewhere between there. So, what you'd see is a, uh, let me just bring up a blog on this. So what you'd see is that um, all, in, all uh, substantial assets would be expected to pay uh, as much tax as, like I said, as if that money were in a bank deposit. So how's that calculated? Well, you have the deemed rate of return. What's the What's the rate of interest on the uh, dep bank deposit? That then gets included as income in a person's tax return and they pay tax at their marginal tax rate. Okay, so for top earners that'll be 33%. So, like I said, if you had a 5% deemed rate of return and you were paying tax at 33%, that works out at a tax of about 1.5% on the value of that asset each and every year. Okay. Now if we tax to that level, our very conservative calculations, so it, we probably generate more revenue than this, but our conservative calculations suggest that you could drop income taxes by a third. Now like I said, most people pay about 24%, 25% income tax on average, so that works out about 8% of your salary. So just to give an example, based on the average median, the median household in New Zealand earns around about 80,000 per year. Okay? And has about 250,000 in their house of equity, worth of equity, okay? So we're deducting debt from this. You don't pay tax on the full value of your house, you deduct the debt that you have. So if you cut their income taxes by, uh, by about a third, they would save, they would get about $6,000 more per year. If we tax their, the $250,000 that's in their family home, that would uh, mean that they would pay just under $4,000 a year extra. So the net, the net benefit is about $2,000 a year better off. Okay, so that's 40 bucks a week. For the average, it's the median household in New Zealand. Okay? So that's, I mean, you can see very quickly why at least 80% of people are better off from this tax change. Uh, because most people are earning and don't have massive assets. In fact, half of Kiwis don't own the house that they live in. Uh, yeah. Why aren't people voting for this? <laughs> Half of, so, so anyone who's renting is automatically better off. 40% of Kiwis own nothing. Yeah, and struggle. Yeah, and they're the ones that are really struggling. Yes, we have another question. All right, can I just quickly ask Jeff, yeah. the deemed rate of return for this tax, is that something that you'd imagine the Reserve Bank would decide, or who, who would be deciding that rate? Who would be deciding that? Uh, yeah, I mean, you'd set it to some sort of, uh, you know, common, common level. Uh, so that would be, you know, your 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 ten-year bond rate, or your or your uh, or what what most people could get in a, with a long-term bank deposit. Um, so it's, I would imagine though, it's it's gonna, you know, it it is gonna move, but you you. You know, these things do fluctuate up and down a little bit, so you'd want to smooth that out for simplicity in your tax system. Yeah.
Yeah, Barbara. Um, I suppose my area of concern is people who are renting. If a landlord is paying this tax, what's stopping the landlord from just passing it on to the person who's renting from them in their <clears throat> rent? Yeah. So, so this is why it's important to phase the tax in, because if you brought it in overnight, it would push rents up. Um, but if we do phase this in over time, landlords and landlords and farmers really are the two that really benefit from that phasing in because they have time to you know, adjust their portfolios or um, they have time for uh, the, you know, rent, rents will naturally increase over time and the, and the prices, the value of that house will be staying the same. So by the time you fully phase this in, landlords and uh, farmers should actually not be paying any more tax than, uh, you know, they, than they would normally anyway. Yeah, 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 because, because the value is fixed, so the value is coming down in real terms, and over, over that time their incomes are rising. So you'd expect that their incomes will, well, that effectively in the future, once this tax is fully in place, the value of rental properties and the value of land will be restricted to what the productive use of that rental property or that land. So you won't see rental properties or, or farms getting ridiculous, you know, uh, capital gain. People will be able to afford to buy farms. Young farmers will be able to afford to buy farms because they'll be able to take out a loan and run the farm and pay off the loan and they won't be disadvantaged by that because the tax keeps the value of the, of the farm or the rental property effectively capped at a level at which they can generate a real profitable return. Yeah. Question? So maybe you already answered it, but if I'm a landlord, what do I do? I not have to pay tax on the rent anymore, mm. or am I? Or if I sell the house, if I sell the property I own, I don't have to pay tax on the actual gain that I make if I do make a gain. You yeah, know, I mean, our proposal is is not a capital gains tax, so yeah, you don't pay you don't pay tax on the gain, and I'd put it to you that most of that gains already happened. I don't think I don't think we're going to see a lot of money coming through a capital gains tax. In fact, we could, we could, in fact, the government could lose money on a capital gains tax if house prices fall in value. But landlords will, so a, a landlord or a farm would pay tax on their rent or their income or the imputed value, whichever is greater. So if if, as most landlords now, as we can see from this chart, are, are not paying, you know, they're, 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 the, the return on their rental income is roughly between 2 and 3% of the value of that property. Same with farmers. Like I said, a lot of sheep and beef farmers are, are, are paying tax on, say, 2% of the value of their property, if that, each and every year. This would, when fully implemented, make sure that they are paying at least the deemed rate of return of the value of their property each and every year. If they have a higher income, that's fine. They'll tax that, just as we do now. But the deemed rate of return, make sure they're paying a minimum level of tax. Yeah. And like I said, I think what we'll see over time in terms of downstream effects is that that will cap the value of rental properties and, uh, and farms at, at a level which they can generate a profitable, sustainable return. And that's calculated on the net asset value? Yeah. So the question was, that's calculated on the net asset value, and that is really important. So debt is excluded from this. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't discourage people from borrowing money. It doesn't discourage people from borrowing money. Absolutely. Yeah. 
as long as they can generate a productive return instead of on the invested funds, yeah, rather than borrowing for capital, for, to speculate for capital gain, which is what we do at the moment. Sorry, yes, James. Uh, so my question relates to uh, your recent blog post about how the tax working group can make polluters pay and encourage business growth. Personally, I'd love to be able to afford to live in a home, but it gets to irrelevancy if our rivers are polluted, if our lands lack carbon and nitrogen. Mm. How does putting a price on carbon, a price on water, and alongside these policies, encouraging investment in these areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like I said previously, the this tax loophole has effectively encouraged overinvestment as farmers are chasing capital gain. And the key issue we have with that is that the value of a farm is based on the the value of um, of revenue that that farm generates, not the profit. The revenue, okay, turnover. So turnover is what drives ca uh, capital value, which is what drives capital gain. So this is one of the drivers of why we've seen excessive intensification on our farms as farmers are chasing increased turnover, more production, and therefore higher capital gain. It the yeah, it increases the, the value of the operation, absolutely right. Even though it doesn't increase profit. So like I said, a lot of these tr troubles that we've seen in the McKenzie country, it's not increasing profit. It's certainly not increasing the, the value of NZ Inc but it is increasing the value of that land, which isn't taxed, so of course people are gonna chase it. So just, can I just, to follow that up, yeah. so if we're trying to reward the good players, if farmers are investing in increasing carbon in their land, better quality water, that's gonna increase the value of their property in real terms. Absolutely, yeah. And that is where you know, pricing for nitrogen and carbon does, does come in. If we're in encouraging you know, uh, our our land-based businesses to operate in a way that you know regenerates rather than depletes our environment, then uh, you know the the more sustainable businesses get rewarded, and the more um, you know the less sustainable businesses get punished. The way we're doing things right now, incidentally, by grandparenting the right to to pollute, is actually making the problem worse. Because the land values, again, it's all about capital gain. <laughs> That's why the dairy industry is lobbying for grandparenting pollution rights. The, it's all about capital gain. I want to keep the right to pollute and make sure others pollute less because that pushes up the value of my property. Yeah. All right, here's another one from the internet, Jeff. Uh, what is the approach to corporate taxes? Yeah. So. Corporate taxes, just coming back to this slide once again, corporate taxes are you know, effectively the way we tax investment income. Uh, I was having this discussion beforehand, effectively a, a, capital, gain, a capital gains tax does apply to, to, to businesses as well, um, but effectively that tax is always going to get is currently collected anyway. It just takes longer. So because the capital value of a business is the long-term expected returns from that business, currently we, we tax profits as it is anyway. And so a capital gains tax just kind of brings that forward, which you know will make it more difficult for, for businesses. Uh, but it is it's really about the, the time value of money rather than having to pay more money overall. And that's the same thing with corporate, biz, uh, corporate taxes in New Zealand. It's all really a form of income tax. It's just a question of how quickly you collect it and how long you leave it with the business in the meantime. So how this, how this affects business, we're talking about reducing income tax rates substantially as a result of this tax reform. And that applies to business as well, because, like I said, income taxes are effectively 
what business is paying taxes anyway at the end, at the end of the day at, when it all washes out. Um, so the bottom line is if we're able to tax all investments the same, businesses are going to pay less tax and that's why we're going to have an incentive to actually invest in, in businesses that create income and jobs and exports. Now if we're talking about those businesses that currently dodge tax, our tax proposal makes that much harder. Multinationals, land-based businesses, businesses that are just set up to be a write-off. So for example, I won't name any particular business, but I went on a very nice bike ride a few years ago and there was one particular cafe I stayed at which must have been worth a couple of million bucks. I stopped at, I should say, on a bike ride. There is no way this cafe was wiping its nose in terms of generating enough return to pay for the incredible space that this cafe was set in. So I got talking to the owner. Turns out the owner's husband is a lawyer in Auckland. Flies down every weekend. This business is a lifestyle business. It's a tax write-off. The whole thing is a tax write-off. Presumably against her husband's law business in Auckland. Now, you wouldn't get away with that with this tax regime in place. Because that business, that cafe, would have to be paying a return on the capital investment that had gone into that cafe. And I tell you, that would have been <laughs> eye-wateringly high. There's no, there's no way they would have been able to live off business write-offs from her husband's law business in Auckland. So businesses in general, productive businesses pay less. But if you're an unproductive business, you're a business that's riding, riding on uh, tax write-offs or, or a business that is riding on, uh, you know, on untaxed capital gain, that would hurt. This, this tax would, would hurt. Yes. So, two things. One is um, Brightline. Yes. That goes. The Brightline test on, uh, on that would go. capital gain. Yeah. Uh, I haven't. I haven't thought that through. Um, I mean, effectively, there wouldn't be any capital gain anyway. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty moot. It's a pretty moot point. Um, but with this tax in place. You, there's, there's no need for, a, for any sort of capital gains tax, yeah. Yep. yeah. Um, and the second thing was, if a business value increases, surely it should be subject to the same regime. So if, if the business value increases? Yeah. Yeah, so if the, business, if the business value increases, that business is going to have to generate a return, a minimum deemed rate of return based on that higher value. So yeah. Eventually, they, they end up paying that. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I mean, but what I mean is eventually they end up paying the capital gain. Capital gain gets taxed eventually under this model. Yeah. I've got another question. Um, generally, the, one of the rationales for tax reductions is that they have a stimulatory effect on the economy. Yeah. Um, can you just talk about what, what effect your modelling suggests your tax changes would have on liquidity and consumption? In, in the economy? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a massive question um, that you could, uh, you know, you could run a general equilibrium model on. Uh, I mean, we had some modelling done by, um, by uh, Sense Partners uh, a couple of, couple of years ago, I think, um, and it was all very positive for the economy, but I, I don't like to dwell on on that sort of stuff because those you know that those sorts of numbers are, are, are wizardry and guesswork um, so yes it will it, it would uh, encourage investment and spur innovation and you know ultimately lift our, our productivity and our and our income growth uh, that much I think we can we can all agree on but guessing how much that impact would be is quite difficult but what I can tell you is that when we look at the countries that have economies based on investing in businesses that create jobs and exports, 
They're the ones that are performing a hell of a lot better than ours. Yeah. Another one from All the right, internet. yeah, let's have another one from the internet. Um, I'll read it out. I suspect most detractors of TOPS tax policy resist it because all their working lives, they've direct directed most of their investment energy towards getting on the property ladder. And they're afraid of what happens if that energy turns out to have been wasted. Yeah. What do you think TOP can do on a policy level to help get these, or to help these people get on board? Yeah. So first and foremost, I would say that, uh, as I said, this policy will be, would be phased in over 10 to 15 years. So we're not out to we're not out to crash the housing market and the banking system. That's not really going to be helpful. Um, so what we want to see is house prices held stable for 10 to 15 years. That gives people time, while that tax is being implemented, that gives people time to change their, their asset portfolios, reduce their investment in housing and, and increase their investment in things that can generate them other forms of income. So I think that phase-in period is, is the major thing that, that I would say. But realistically, in terms of negotiating with, a, uh, with any potential coalition partners, if anyone was to, in, you know, to put this tax in place, the big guys would, you know, Labour or National, would probably want to put a minimum threshold on the asset that we're talking about. So, you know, how much tax-free wealth do you want to have, folks? Uh, you know, half a million, a million, two million? I mean, that's the... That's the debate to have. As I said, bearing in mind, 40% of the country has nothing. So, microphone if you want to ask a question. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, you know, the real politic of this is that there probably would be a threshold on the asset. That's open for, for, for debate. But you could put that at a level that most Kiwis, uh, you know, wouldn't pay, wouldn't pay anything on. Uh, and you could do that quite easily because, like I said, the median household has, a house, has equity in their house of about 250k, which is, which is tiny. Uh, cool. Any more from the room? More from the room? More from the internet? Right, I've got one more from the internet then. Uh, Jeff, why does the tax propose taxing foreigners 3%? Oh, ah, uh, yes. The proposed tax on foreigners, why is that 3%? Uh, the answer is, <laughs> uh, in, in all honesty, um, so that's, let, let me tell you the, the rush, rationale behind that. And there's two things there. So, firstly, well, b before I give the rationale, give the, let me, let me just, uh, clarify something that, that people might, might not understand. That is for non-tax residents. That proposal was for non-tax residents. Okay? So it's not just, it's not recent migrants to the country because they would be paying tax, they would be tax residents in New Zealand. The whole idea of that tax is to give people an incentive to declare their income in New Zealand to be tax resident in New Zealand. So think of it as the Peter Thiel tax, right? Because if he actually declared his worldwide income in New Zealand, that'd be absolutely fine, you know? That would be a massive bo a boon to us. <laughs> exactly, yeah, we'd, we'd take that. Um, so it's, if, if, if what, what, what that proponent, what that idea is saying is also, if you don't want to declare your income and your worldwide taxable income in New Zealand, then we'll hit you harder. So it's, it's trying to provide an incentive for that. The other thing I would say is uh, the kind of people that we are talking about here actually have huge portfolios around the world that they could easily manipulate to give uh, a New Zealand taxable income. So for example, if you are Peter Thiel and you own land all over the world, you probably owe some money somewhere. Now what we don't want to do is, is for, for Peter Thiel to say, oh look, 
yes, I own a $10 million property in New Zealand, but I also have this $10 million loan that could be financing anything in his, in his business empire, right? But he might just say, oh, look, that loan is actually taken out so that I can have this land in New Zealand. So therefore, I can write that off and I don't have to pay any tax on my land in New Zealand. So that's another reason why doubling the, the, you know, the, the, the tax for non-tax residents to make sure that they are at least paying something on the value of that, of that land. Another way to do it, which I've been talking about, uh, I've been exploring, is that you could say you're only allowed to write it off against New Zealand denominated, New Zealand dollar denominated debt, because at least then we get, we get the profits from the banks, which, we pay, which, which they pay tax on, right? So there's different ways to do that sort of thing. Um, but perhaps by, I thought by explaining the intent behind that, uh, that provision, that might shed some light. But why double? It was a finger in the air. Yeah. Any other Further questions? questions from the room? Oh, yeah. Last one here. There you go. Oh, hi, oh. Jeff. Um, yeah. I've got a question. Have you shared this policy with our friends, um, our Labour friends, Green friends, New Zealand First? And what have they said about it? Like, what's their reason for not accepting it? Um, <coughs> It's a very good question. Um, I mean, it's safe to say that there is a, a, a diversity of views amongst, uh, amongst those parties uh, about, about implementing this. Um, I would say the level of tax, uh, you know, understanding of tax in those, you know, in, in amongst all politicians is not hugely high. So it's a um, of oh I mean I think um, I mean I think for a lot of people you know taxing the family home is, is seen as sacrosanct. Um, I have you know I don't I don't want to um, you know dump anyone in it but but there are uh, there are people uh, on you know in um, in the Labour Party who have said that they like the idea of this tax if there was an exemption, some sort of, you know, minimum level of exemption for the for the average family home. The question is what you set that at. You know, like I said before. Um, yeah, uh, on the, you know, on the on the right of the spectrum, obviously, they like the idea of being able to reduce the tax on other forms of investment. So that, that side of things is, uh, you know, is promising for them. The question is, where do you get the money from if you're not, gonna, if you're not prepared to tax the family home? Yeah. Yeah. Any, any More others? Questions? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, because you're referring to, you know, using the asset tax on like super yachts and such. Yeah. Um, does it go to every asset class? Like if you've got super rich with artwork, are they paying yeah. the asset tax on that? Yep, absolutely. Every asset class, I mean, again, you would have some sort of, you know, b basic level of um, threshold upon, over which an asset would be considered for this tax, but that is, that is the theory, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gold, art, anything that, that the, you know, that wealthy people are sitting on that, uh, that might, that, that gives them benefit, basically. What are, what are the benefits you get from, from holding these assets? Yeah. Any others from online or have we... From online you've mostly covered it. Anyone, okay. anyone else from the room? I've got a question. I've got a question, Jeff. Yeah. So the tax working group is about to have their, have their findings made public um, a little bit later this week and I just I really want to know what the Opportunities Party thinks about the results of the tax working group. Is there some kind of place I could go to to find out what that might be? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so we will be, um, you know, we will be posting up some uh, some response to the um, to the uh, tax working group when that comes out. So yeah, like us on Facebook, uh, the Opportunities Party on Facebook. Uh, top.org.nz is our web page 
you know, you can um, you can go there for for uh, blogs and sign up uh, sign up for our emails. Absolutely. And what if I prefer to get my information in a sort of panel style discussion? Oh yes, now I see where you're going, Ben. Absolutely. <laughs> so yes, uh, Thursday Thursday next week on the 28th, uh, we are going to have a, a, a panel discussion, um, and that is really trying to broaden uh, perspectives about, about the uh, tax working group because it, it seems to have just narrowed in on this idea of a, of a capital gains tax and when there are so many, so many more options that, that could be explored. Um, of course, uh, you know, writing off the idea of taxing the family home is, is, a, is a major uh, roadblock to that conversation but nonetheless there are still many options. So. Uh, so yeah, we're going to have a, a group in Wellington next week on the 28th, uh, 6 p.m. at JJ Murphy's, uh, a panel discussion about the tax working group. Feel free to come along. And oh, oh yes, uh, I'll be there. Um, uh, we've got Peter Wilson, tax expert from NZIER. We've got Andrew Coleman, um, who's a uh, tax and economics lecturer from uh, Otago University, and. Uh, Eric Crampton from the New Zealand Initiative. Wow, that's really exciting. And if, anyone, <laughs> if anyone's interested in a more robust um, demonstration against the findings of the Tax Working Group, I'd be interested in talking to you. Something a bit more rowdy, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not you, Patty. I won't be involved. I'll just I'll get it organised. <laughs> Great. Hey, well, thank you for your time. Thanks for watching at home. <laughs>